Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, we're gonna today it's gonna be lecture number ten, and we're gonna finish the orofacial infections topic. So this topic has been go through now for about four weeks from now. So this is week number four, and lecture number four uh, belongs to the orofacial or dentofacial infections. So today we're gonna discuss. We're gonna talk. We're gonna and talk more about the bone infections and some other uh, infectious disease that happen in the orofacial region. So by the end of the tutorial, I'm expecting from you guys to know what is Ludwig's angina, osteomyelitis, osteoradionecrosis, and bisphosphonate related osteoradionecrosis of the jaw, sorry, osteonecrosis of the jaw, and cavernous sinus thrombosis, and finally, I, uh, acute ulcerative necrotizing gingivitis. So Ludwig's angina. I gave you a hint last week about this condition, but I decided to repeat it today because it's a life-threatening condition. And this, uh, as you can see here, so the spaces involved in this infections are a bilateral, submandibular, submental, and in sublingual, which is in sorrow, like you can see it from here, involvement of the spaces. So we see here this is a generalized and diffuse cellulitis over the affected area. And the most important thing in the management of this condition, in addition to the previous discussed uh, principles, is to maintain the airways, airway protection. So after refer the patient to the hospital. Once you receive it at the hospital, you have to maintain the airways. Then we're gonna have an IV route to administer fluids and antibiotics. After that, you're gonna do the surgery by doing incision and drainage under GA. In this case, we're gonna do it under GA. Once we drain everything, then we give them an analgesic just to reduce pain as well. So the most important part of Ludwig's angina is airway protection. If you if you focus only on the drainage and incision, okay, it's good. But if you forget to maintain the airway during your procedure, highly unlikely to have that patient there. So the other option is, the, sorry, the other condition we're gonna to discuss today is osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis, in brief, it's a bone infection. So it could affect uh, the bone and the soft tissue covering or inside the bone. So what covers the bone? is the periosteum, so that could affect the periosteum. What's inside the bone? It, the bone contains blood vessels, nerves, and bone marrow. So this, again, is gonna affect the uh, nerves and blood vessels inside the bone. So a classification of osteomyelitis is gonna be acute, subacute, and chronic. For these two, we don't have any radiographical changes happened, only, it's only clinical and you're gonna know what's the signs of symptoms. The chronic then itself is gonna be divided into Gary's osteomyelitis and diffuse uh, sectorosing osteomyelitis. So what about the signs and symptoms? As I say, acute and subacute when you have the clinical signs, like deep, the patient is gonna uh, complain from deep-seated pain, the tooth the associated or accused tooth is tender to percussion, like this here, and we're gonna have a hard swelling over the accused area and with lymphadenopathy and altered sensation. This is actually the most important two diagnostic features here is deep seated pain and altered sensation. Why it's altered sensation? As I mentioned earlier, because the, the bone and especially the mandible, which is the most common uh, site for osteomyelitis in the head, uh, it's uh, it has the nerve, inferior nerve in it. So any infection to the bone will lead to the damaging to the nerve. Or maybe if we have edema inside the bone or swelling inside the bone, again, this swelling is going to press over the nerve and you're going to have an altered sensation like tingling, numbness, uh, loss of function of the muscles if you have a motor involvement. So and again, the radiographical features of this, of, of osteomyelitis, it, uh, 
it's only seen when we reach the chronic stage. But in acute and subacute, we don't have any radiographical changes, only clinical features. But when we reach the chronic stage, we're going to have what we call the moth eaten appearance. Moth eaten appearance means farasha mal ith, bilabat mithar shikil hai, shikil janah malit hai. Okay, what's that? why that's happened? Because when we have infection, part of the bone is going to be destroyed, like this one. We're going to have a radiolucence area within the relatively radio opaque area of the mandible. And if, as you can see here, this point and this point, you see the island of bone floating in radiolucency. This means that's what we call a sequestra. A sequestra. Okay, that's, this is due to the uh, damage to the bone, and uh, which means it's a good indicator for chronic osteomyelitis. And again, this is another picture for the chronic osteomyelitis. Clinically, you're gonna have see this picture like this one and this one, like necrotizing tissue or exposed bone. This is the late stage. And keep in mind, guys, osteomyelitis, osteoradionecrosis, and bisphosphonate associated osteonecrosis and osteonecrosis, all of these terms share the same clinical feature. Same like this. But only how can we differentiate from each one? It's based on the cause of the condition. We're gonna have that in detail. So osteomyelitis is definitely due to a bacterial infection of the bone. So as you can see here, this is some bony islands here, and we have a moth-eaten appearance extending from the molar region to the molar region on the right side. And this is the CT scan image or combium CT scan image for the same condition, you see this is what we mean by the moth eaten appearance that the bone is punched out or like some, like, like a cheese, okay? Like a Swiss cheese. And what about the moth eaten appearance. Okay, osteomyelitis, as I mentioned, is gonna be acute, subacute, and chronic. In the chronic, we have two, two types. The first one, which is Gary's osteomyelitis. In this uh, condition, it happens only in the young and children, so we cannot see it in adults, and associated with the lower border of the mandible. And the most diagnostic and clinical feature, we have a subcoreosteal or endosteal bone formation in volcanum, which means that at the time of infection, Okay, okay, we have a bone destruction, but at the same time, the human body starts to develop and form a new bony material directly underneath the periosteal, uh, the periosteal layer. So, as you see here, this is the lower border of the mandible. Clinically, this one is a hard or firm nodule located at the lower border of the mandible, you see here, and when we see at this area, we have a shadow here, which is the skin, onion skin-like appearance due to the newborn formation under the periosteum. You see, this is the thin line shadow here. Okay, it's obvious here, so you can see it here. Okay, this is the thin layer of the bone that firm confirmed. Okay, how do we manage the osteomyelitis foremost and forever? remove the source of infection. Sometimes an old restoration, you can just change it and the problem is gonna be solved. Sometimes a poor root canal treatment. If you do a retreatment, you're gonna fix the problem. Or if the tooth is hopeless, just extract the tooth and follow up. During this time, you have to give an antibiotic because this, even if you don't have fever, because this is deeply seated inside the uh, uh, the bone, and uh, if we have a pus or, or uh, we have to do a drainage and we do a debridement for the bone, like just shaving and cleaning the bone and remove any sequestra of the bone. If the case is severe, just like this one, let's go back. If the case is severe, just like this one, the only thing is the treatment is to do mandibular sectioning and reconstruction with the plates.
Okay, so quick quiz for you guys. What is the best antibiotic that we can use in case of osteomyelitis? To make things easy for you, I need an antibiotic that can reach the bone easily and directly. I hope you will answer me on the private comment on this lecture. Okay, so osteoradionecrosis. So, which means the cause of necrosis of the bone or death of the bone is due to a radiotherapy. We know that cancer patients, they receive radio and chemotherapy. So radiotherapy, one of the most important side effects, it's uh, radio, uh, it's osteoradionecrosis, especially when we have to treat the patients of oral cancer. So they're gonna have a consequent skin cancer or they cause it, uh, ulcerative fasciitis or osteoradial crosses if it's reached the bone. So why do we have, why the uh, necrosis has been developed? Because with the progressive radiation and increased the radiation dose, more than 55 degree of radiation is gonna lead to the, what we call the end arthritis or obliterance, which means like the blockage and destruction of small blood vessels at the bone. Once we cut, once once the, the once uh, the blood vessels is damaged, which means there is we don't have any blood supply, any nourishment comes to the bone, which will lead to the death of the bone consequently. So, how do we manage such case? First of all, all of the most always I'm telling you guys take a deep history from the patient, ask in details. Okay, if you have a patient, ask him if you have any, uh, any previous radiation, any medication, whatever, because we need to know everything about the patient before starting any treatment. Okay, then let's prefer to do all surgical procedures before starting any radiotherapy. When it's, uh, if you have a patient, a regular patient, and he comes regular to your clinic and telling you, okay, I had a cancer, I have to do my radiotherapy visit, visits. I need to finish all of my surgical procedures for my oral cavity first. So this is most important, guys. This management's only for oral surgery. It's not included in restorative or in root canal or even a coronal bridge. It's only for surgery and periodontal treatment. Okay, then if we have a patient in your clinic, had the radiotherapy like two or three weeks ago, and he need an urgent treatment, or let's say for extraction of a tooth. Again, we need to be as traumatic, as traumatic as possible. Like means no sharp bones left, socket closure, and don't don't use excessive force. Use the appropriate instrument. Okay, then we will give a pre and post antibiotics, and finally we give a mouthwash, even pre and post mouthwash, just to make sure that we're gonna have a clean, aseptic, non-sharp uh, operation site to prevent the development of radionecrosis. Bronze or bisphosphonate related osteonecrosis of the jaw. Again, bisphosphonate is a medication that used to manage multiple myeloma osteoporosis, Hodges disease. They will give this uh, disease, this sorry, this medication just to alleviate, that's to reduce the complication associated with these uh, conditions. The mode of action of this medication or bisphosphonate is by inhibit the osteoclast activity and this is the main function. But they found they also reduce the vascularity of the bones which will lead to the development of osteonecrosis. So again, radiotherapy reduce uh, uh, vascularity of the blood and bisphosphonate again reduce the vascularity of the blood, which will lead to the same consequence, which is osteonecrosis. It affects the mandible more than the maxilla. Female, why? Because female are more prone to, uh, are, more, are, more, are more affected with the osteoporosis than the male and management, just as I mentioned before, the same thing for the osteoradionic process. Okay, 
Now, a dangerous, a second dangerous, a life-threatening infection and the head and neck region is the cavernous sinus thrombosis after Ludwig's angina or even before Ludwig's angina. So cavernous sinus, it's responsible for the venous drainage of the brain. It's a fall between uh, dur uh, dura matter and uh, pedurum, okay, of the brain here. So it's located and extended from the superior orbital fissure anteriorly till the apex of the petrosal bone posteriorly. So as I said, it's responsible for the venous drainage of the brain. So any bacteria that can reach this area will go direct to the brain and cause a serious life-threatening conditions reaching to death. So how can virus the virus or how can the bacteria or infection reach this area? It's either by two ways. Anterior pathway is, is uh, via the facial vein, then the superior ophthalmic vein is going to go to the uh, cavernous sinus, or the posterior pathway is through uh, facial vein again, but reach the trigoid venous plexus, then from that point, we're going to go up to the cavernous land. So what are the most dangerous spaces that can lead to this uh, infection? It's, we call it the dangerous area, which is here, this area. Like any infection from the upper anterior teeth, okay, or sinusitis can lead to this condition. So what's included inside this uh, uh, sinus is we have an internal carotid artery, we have the ocular motor nerve, trochlear nerve, ophthalmic nerve a branch of the trigeminal, and the maxillary nerve, which is another branch of the trigeminal, and abducent nerve. So as you can see, almost this and this and this nerves are responsible for the eye movement. So that's why you can see this uh, the ptosis of the eyelid and difficulties in moving the eye with some problem to the pupil, which is not clear on this picture, unfortunately. But again, this is the clinical feature of the patient come to your clinic with this feature, immediately sent to the hospital. So we have the oedema uh, or cellulitis extend over the eyes and the saddle of the nose. And difficulty in moving of the eyes and ptosis, ptosis yani sukut, how to handle the chiffin tosis of the eyebrows? Sorry, uh, yeah, tosis of the eye, which is because the swelling inside this cavernous sinus will affect the oculomotor nerve that's responsible for this levator palpebrae superioris muscle here, which is responsible for the eyelid. So we have a tosis of the eyelid, other uh, clinical features, and again. How do you manage it? Send it to the hospital. And finally, we reach the acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis or periodontitis. This disease is associated with poor oral hygiene. It can happen to the young patients too, especially the gingivitis one, at the exam time because of stress and negligence of the oral cavity of oral hygiene. And the, the the distinctive clinical feature of this disease is punched out interdental papilla. As you see, we don't have an interdental papilla here. It's gone. It's ulcerated and it's gone. But that's what we call it a punched out interdental papilla. Beside, in addition to that, we're going to have a pain, bad odor, and bleeding with lymphadenopathy and fever. How do we manage this condition? Initial management, we have to do scaling and polishing. Oral hygiene instructions, ask the patient to do tooth brushing, give him a mouthwash, and follow up with him, and give him an analgesic and antibiotic. The drug of choice here is the metronidazole as an antibiotic. Later, if we get control of the condition, we can do a periodontal surgery, like a grafting or a flap or guided bone regeneration just to correct a defect happened due to this uh, disease.
And again, it is microbial disease. Okay, it's a microbial and caused by bacteria. So I hope by the end of this tutorial that you get a summary and a brief of what uh, of about the topics that we mentioned today. And uh, please have a look on the lectures because, as I mentioned, we're going to have uh, an exam after uh, Eid, inshallah. And I hope you study well and have a good day. Thank you. Bye -bye.